We're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. This is our post-landing news conference with the STS-132 astronauts. And here with us is uh, Ken Ham, the commander from the mission. He will uh, make a few comments, and uh, then uh, very shortly thereafter, we will take questions from the media present. So, Ken? Thanks, George. In a very short sentence, we're thrilled. And we're thrilled because we accomplished the mission that was put in front of us. And uh, a long time ago when we were first assigned as a crew, one of our goals as we laid them out for the year in front of us was to, uh, to have fun and to include everyone on the ground team in our fun and hopefully bleed some of the enthusiasm we have for spaceflight into the rest of the world. And, uh, since we've been back, we've been hearing stories about how folks have been having fun and enjoyed watching us have fun. Uh, and that's really important to us. So from that perspective, we're thrilled. On the real the serious side, we, uh, we brought a Russian module up, did something that uh, has never been done before by birthing that module with a Russian docking system on a robotic arm to the International Space Station. And these great guys next to me, that might be the only time I call you that. Uh, <laughs> Did some great spacewalking, and uh, Tony did some great IVing, and Piers down there did some incredible arm operations, supporting all three EVAs. And it's kind of interesting because Piers was uh, the guy on this flight that had more EVA experience than anybody, and now he's a robotic, and he still, st and he still does. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? Yeah. He still has more EVA experience than anyone else on the crew. And now he's. Uh, <laughs> an accomplished robotics arm specialist, yeah. which I think is pretty darn cool. Old man. <laughs> and speaking of, uh, of peers, really sir, I think you have a moment of your own with the microphone. <laughs> <coughs> For the record, <laughs> and in front of everybody, I'd like to thank my family and my wife in particular for putting up with months and months of absences and grumpiness while we got ready for this meeting, and also for a fantastic selection of wake-up music, which I unfortunately <laughs> missed by being in the wrong module at the wrong time. <laughs> but my commander felt that I owed that to uh, <clears throat> the world. Same. And my wife. Same. Thank you. My name is Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Nicely done. We'll take questions now. Please give the name <laughs> <laughs> affiliation. When the microphone comes with you, we'll start here with uh, James. James Dean, Florida today. Um, if, if not for the uh, commander and pilot who might have been otherwise occupied, did any of you have a chance to think about Atlantis's uh, history and career as you were coming in for landing this morning? Whether or not we know it's the last flight, yeah. Well, I didn't have much time to think about it today, to be honest with you. Um, we were pretty busy getting her ready to come home and then uh, putting the orange suits on and strapping in and bringing her back from uh, Mach 25. We just inched up over Mach 25 before we started slowing down again uh, after the burn. Um, but we did, we did have time on orbit to, to think about it, reflect about it, talk about it a little bit. Um, obviously, we've all flown on Atlantis now. Some of us have flown on her a couple times, and uh, it's a great ship, and uh, it was a real honor to be on the last flight if, uh, if this turns out to be the last flight. And we're happy to bring her back home to uh, here to Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, I was going to ask, ask for you personally, as you've flown both your missions on Atlantis, um, w w how it will loom in, in, in your career and your, your spectacles uh, a third flight. So uh, um, how, how's, uh, how are you going to remember Atlantis in terms of being the vehicle vehicle for all, all your shuttle flights. Mm -hmm. 
uh, assuming we don't get an extension beyond. Uh, yeah, I guess I can't, uh, I can't scratch out one more at this point, uh, although I'd love to, and I'm available. <laughs> But uh, Atlantis treated us very well. I mean, she was just an incredible ship. She uh, just worked perfectly. Uh, we were saying in the, uh, on the deorbit burn on the way home, I mean, the engines had it trimmed out to within 0.01 of, I mean, of, of what the burn was supposed to be. And uh, it was just amazing. She just uh, performed flawlessly and, and let us do our jobs and our tasks that we were assigned to do to, to take things up and, uh, and get them done. Marsha? Marcia Dent, Associated Press, probably at least for the two pilots. Um, 120 million miles is a lot of miles. How did Atlantis look with all that mileage on her? Oh, she looks great. I don't know if you had a chance to get out uh, to the runway when she was uh, still on the runway, but just absolutely fabulous. Um, for a, I don't know how old your car is. Um, I ended up uh, with a new one uh, this summer when the government wanted uh, wanted my old truck real bad, um, so I couldn't uh, couldn't turn down the offer. But uh, just an in incredible spaceship. She, uh, like Bueno was saying, she really performed well on uh, this flight. And uh, reflecting on it, not so much uh, while we were flying because I was still worried about Hawks landing, but um, had a chance to grab a sandwich uh, before we uh, came over to here to talk to y'all and uh, saw him taxi in Atlantis off the runway and uh, even had to grab Hawk and go hey they're taxiing her off the runway and uh, that, I hope it's not the last time they do that but uh, but it it might be and uh, it uh, it's a shame she is from the condition we brought her back in and the condition that the great folks at the Kennedy Space Center are going to turn her around she is so ready to get stacked and back out to the launch pad you can tell that's where she wants to be Okay, next question. Hi, Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. Um, I know a lot of you actually are making, made a return trip to the International Space Station, and I wonder if anybody wanted to share thoughts about how it had changed since you had seen it last, and especially how it looks now when you guys left it almost fully assembled. Yeah, she, um, it felt like home, you know, when I got back there. I spent a bunch of time up on the space station before, and, um, when, but there are some definite changes. Uh, this crew has got the station really ship shape. I mean, uh, she is neat and tidy, uh, and they've got it very well organized, so it was a very comfortable place, even with twice the number of crew members on board than were there when I was there. And the biggest uh, addition is the cupola, uh, and it's uh, fantastic to look out at the Earth uh, from the cupola. And you can see from horizon to horizon and get a real idea of uh, the whole span of the Earth, rather than just a small view that you kn we get, uh, we got previously out of one window at a time, and and uh, more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that operationally, as far as using the robot arm, and as far as observing spacewalks, the cupola is an unbelievably fantastic uh, tool, because uh, we we got we got used to training ourselves to fly that robotic arm by using all these different cameras, each of which gives you a little tiny piece of the big picture and sometimes you can fool yourself and it, sometimes it's very confusing and it's very slow every time you have to change a camera it takes time and uh, there are times that we trained to do the operations using those cameras because we didn't know if the cupola was going to be available to us uh, but when we actually started flying the arm I said you can put all those cameras away I, it, I just look at the window I mean it's fantastic so that was a huge change Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Uh, sort of the flip side of that question uh, for Michael Good. Um, since you're the only crew member to have uh, not flown your second flight to the, uh, or your first flight to the station, um, can you compare uh, the, the types of missions, not going to the space station and then going to a satellite like the Hubble Space Telescope? Um, what are the pros and cons of the, of the two types? I thought I was off the hook on that last question. <laughs> <laughs> And then I got to look down here at my commander and say if, if I'm gonna, allowed to say that, say that word. word? <laughs> <laughs> I think since he already drew blood, it's okay. Um, no, it's, um, it's definitely a lot bigger inside than Hubble was. Um, <laughs> we, we, we went out to Hubble and uh, opened up its doors and crawled inside of her and worked on it a little bit. But uh, definitely a, a totally different experience um, going out the airlock over there on the International Space Station. 
and just the amount of room that's inside all the labs, uh, just incredible capability and a lot of room to actually fly around. I mean, I, I talked about floating in space after my last mission, but now I can say that I was able to fly in space because there's so much room up there just to go, but you know, straight down the labs and through the different modules, and it's just like you're flying. So it's a, it was a great experience and in, really an incredible uh, facility. And uh, for the commander, since you, since you did such a great job of sharing the fun, uh, we definitely saw that here on the ground. Um, I wonder what fun we didn't see. Were there any inside jokes amongst the crew that you can share or, or nope. funny experiences? <laughs> None. Um, you saw it all. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing left. <laughs> Good question, though. <laughs> Hi, uh, Eben Brown from Fox News Radio. Um, with uh, two more missions on the on the books and and maybe a possible 135, as everyone keeps talking about, um, how many of you are looking at your next career moves, or how many of you are hoping for 135 and trying to get your name on the list? <laughs> I'll speak for myself. There's no way in the world they're going to let. I'll speak for all of us. There's no way in the world <laughs> <laughs> they're going to let any of us be on that mission. We are available, however. Well, we, we are, are however, available. <laughs> we know how Jerry feels now. <laughs> <laughs> Need one more chance to get it right, that's all. Okay, uh, Justin. Uh, Justin Ray with uh, SpaceFlightNow.com. I guess for anyone that wants to take it, uh, uh, after 12 days up there, what are some of the lasting uh, memories that you're going to keep from this flight? I guess I should answer one. Yeah, <laughs> it's all yours. Mike was kind of a uh, <laughs> good question. No, uh, uh, there were two points that I really thought were quite amazing. We went all the way out to the P6 truss to work on the batteries and. Uh, went on the back side of the truss, and so I was back there all alone. It's just, you're so far away at that point from the living portion of the space station. It's, it's quite amazing to look back and see the, just the size, you know, from the outside. You can't take it all in from out there. You have to turn your head, it's so huge. Uh, my previous flight, the only addition since then was another truss and uh, but it it's it just feels bigger. It feels more complete. And the other time was I was sitting on top of the boom after we had installed the antenna, waiting for some direction as to what to do next. So I had about, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes sitting there basically laying on my back, watching the world go by past the Russian segment. And I was just thinking, how in the world did I end up here? This is just unbelievable. It just seems totally surreal. And a lot of fun at the same time. And it's really going to stick with me. Any additional questions out here? And for the commander, could you just talk a little bit about entry and landing today? How it, how it went and uh, yeah. Yeah, well, it was smooth as silk, and I don't. I'm not talking about my landing. I'm talking about uh, the whole entry profile. It was a, a nice day to come home, but uh, what was absolutely remarkable was. We were going through the high Mach numbers, that's the, the low 20s or so, uh, in what we call the plasma region, where you are quite literally on the inside of a fireball. And uh, on my last mission, that happened in the daylight. And you could sort of see a, a faint pink glow over the nose. This time, it happened at night. And we were clearly riding on the inside of a fireball. And it was absolutely spectacular. The windows, all of them were uh, bright, brilliant orange, uh, out the overhead windows, we could see, uh, I don't know if they were vortices or bursts of plasma kind of shedding off the, the, uh, the top of the orbiter. But one of the neatest things was we flew right into sunrise in this high Mach number region. And uh, sunrise from space is absolutely spectacular. Every one of them is. Uh, it always starts with this beautiful blue colored arc on the limb of the Earth. And what was neat in this case was we could see that blue color kind of burning through the orange. Tony saw it first because we were rolled a certain way, and he said, holy cow, you can see the sunrise through the fireball. I'm like, well, I, you know, I couldn't see over to his side, and then the orbiter rolled, and sure enough, I could see it on my side. I'm like, holy cow, you can see the sunrise through the fireball. So it was uh, visually overwhelming. It was just amazing. Okay, we'll take one more question, and that's going to wrap it up. 
right here. Um, when uh, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com again. Uh, when I we spoke pre-flight, uh, Ken. Um, when we spoke pre-flight, you said that landing might be bittersweet because it marked the end of, of the fun. So, um, sort of, uh, is it is it the end of the fun? And uh, was there a tinge of regret that the rain didn't keep you in space an extra day? Uh, I'm not sure an extra day would have made that much of a difference, to be honest. Um, the fun is really these five guys next to me. And we're going to be around together for quite a while longer, and we're going to continue to have fun. But it, uh, it certainly did strike me, walking around the orbiter today, that... I probably just did the coolest thing I'll ever do in my life. And, uh, and it's over, it's behind me. It's great, it's a great memory, and it's nothing that I feel bad about. Um, it was just one of those moments, kind of walking around looking at the, at the spectacular airplane, knowing that it's over. It's human nature, it's okay. All right, that's gonna conclude our briefing and our STS-132 mission coverage. Thank you very much.